So I showed you the mean value theorem yesterday. Here's the official theorem. I'll put a box around it. Most of the time, you can use a slightly shorter version. Or I talked about that yesterday. You show your differentiable on the whole interval. So we did, there's really only two questions in this uh, section about mean value theorem. One of them we did part of it already. What does the mean value theorem say about f on 0, 2? We computed the average rate of change was 2, and the mean value theorem says there has to be a x value whose slope or whose derivative is 2. Now the second part of this question is find this actual x value. So find this particular C. So we have to figure out what is F prime. So I chose an intentionally easy function. F is X squared. What happens if I plug in C and then take a derivative? Get constant. You're gonna get uh, zero. zero. So that's not what to do. So it turns out F prime of C is not actually equal to zero because you have to take derivative before you plug in the value. So, so don't... Do f prime of x and then take c. Yes, exactly. So f prime x, 2x, easy derivative. And now I want to know, so we could write f prime of c equals 2c. And I want to know when does f prime c equal 2. So f prime of c is 2c, so 2c equals 2. And easiest algebra of the world, c equals 1. So that's the answer. 1 is the x value that has a slope of 2. We can graph it out. Well, we have a graph, I think, somewhere. It's just between 1 and 0 and 2, right? Yeah, 1 is between 0 and 2, yeah. So that's something you should check. A lot of times you get more than one answer. More than one value will have that slope, but you want to make sure the value you got is in right. between. And what I was asking was that's checking between 0 and 2, right? Like I know, I know that we, I know 0 is, or 1 is between 0 and 2. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I mean, right here, that's, that's where I said CSB between 0 and 2. Okay. Uh, luckily, in this function, there was only one point that had a slope of 2. Uh, it's if the function had more curves in it, something like that, there could be, you know, lots of points with slope and of two. Also, wouldn't it be if we were doing between negative two and two, it would be negative one and one with the same slope, right? Yeah. So no. Uh, so this is a parabola. Oh. Wait, that, that's not a graph. So a really fast graph, just zero to two is going to look something like that. Four. So here's the average rate of change right there, and we found a point right here that happened to be 1 that had the same slope. Okay. If, if I went from 0 to 2, uh, negative 2 to 2, I would have had a 0 rate of change. In which, in that case, I would have chosen the point at the bottom that has also a 0 slope. Okay. So it, it applies to whatever interval on this any polynomial, you can choose any closed interval, and you'll find one point at least that has the same slope as the average. Okay. So that is one type of question I can ask. There is a second type we can, I can ask you. And this type is way more complicated, although it looks very innocent.
So I believe that we had this exact problem back in the intermediate value theorem section, except it was missing that word. So show that that has one solution on negative 1 to 1. So there's two parts to this question. Now that we have this word exactly 1, that means not 2, not 0, but exactly 1. So we need to first show there is a solution, and then afterwards show there, there's not a second one. And then two, there is no more than one. So there cannot be other solutions. So we'll do step one first, show there exists a solution. All right, you can try algebra, but I intentionally chose this one so you would fail if you tried algebra. So that's not going to work. Yeah, it's not hard to make a polynomial that doesn't factor nicely. All right, show there exists a solution. So I'm going to make this function f of x to just be the expression that's on the left side of the equation. And I'm going to plug in the two endpoints just to see what we get. f of negative 1 is negative 1 cubed is negative 1 minus 3 plus 1 is negative 3. And f of positive 1 is 1 plus 3 plus 1, which is 5. So I'm not plotting the entire function, just plotting two points of this function. So is this function continuous between negative 1 and 1? Uh, yes. Why is it continuous? So we're going to use intermediate value theorem. So f is continuous because of the polynomial. Most functions you work with are continuous on their domains. So the only points you really need to watch out for are vertical asymptotes. If you take a square root, make sure that you're not plugging in negative values. So most functions we use are continuous on their domains. Uh, so you could say, I, sh I should say continuous on, specifically the interval negative 1 to 1. It's continuous everywhere, but specifically on this interval. So we're going to use the intermediate value theorem, which is not the mean value theorem, but the intermediate value theorem says you have a continuous function on an interval, then you will achieve every y value between the smallest and biggest y values. So what y value do I want to look for between negative 3 and 5? 0. I'm going to look for 0. So somewhere I'm going to have to cross the x-axis. I don't know exactly where. It's pretty easy to see the x-intercept is positive 1 right here. Just plugging in 0. So I can see specifically the 0 actually is going to be between negative 1 and 0. There may, there may be another 0 over here. I don't know. But I know for sure some, some place in between, it's not a straight line, but somewhere on this continuous curve, I have to cross the x-axis. So that's the mean or intermediate value theorem. So I'm choosing. Did I? I think I used why not back then. So 
So y naught is between f of negative 1 and f of 1. So we computed those two are negative 3 and 5, so it's in between negative 3 and positive 5. So this is the hypothesis for the intermediate value theorem. We got a y in between the two other y values. We got a continuous function. So we can apply the intermediate value theorem. So there's this a c minus in the interval minus one to one such that f of c equals this y naught value, which is zero. And just looking at what is f of c, f of c is c cubed plus 3c plus 1. So we found a solution to that equaling 0. So that's uh, a solution to our original equation. Well, I should, at this point, c is a solution to x cubed plus 3x plus 1 equals 0. So we found one solution. So this is the end of part one. There is one solution. And we did this, either this exact problem or one almost just like it, back in the intermediate value theorem section. So now we're going to do part two, show there cannot be any other solutions. So let's suppose there is another solution. So we're going to pretend that there is a second one and then show that that's not possible, which is called proof by contradiction. So we're going to assume there's a second one and show that's not possible. So at this time, we know for sure that there's not a second one? No, I have no idea. Okay. So I'm going to suppose there is one and then hopefully conclude that that's not possible. So uh, we are going to suppose Let's call this uh, C1 to f of x equals 0. So suppose there's another C value, we'll call it C1, that makes f of x equal to 0. So I don't know where C is, but if there's two solutions, one of them has to be less than the other one. So let's just say C1 is less than C. So there's two solutions. One of them has to be smaller than the other one. So I'm just going to order it like this. So we have f of C equals 0 and f of C1 also equals 0. So we have these two uh, conclude they're not actually facts because they're based on a supposition, not on uh, actual fact. So they're conclusions based on that statement right there. All right, so we have f of c equals 0, f of c1 equals 0. So we're in the mean value theorem section, so we better use the mean value theorem, not just the intermediate value theorem. So let's think about the mean value theorem. Do we have a continuous function and differentiable? Yes. Yep. So we got both of those properties, so we can pretty much apply the mean value theorem. Now the question is, what interval do we apply it on? Uh, we are going to actually do the interval from C1 to C. 
It's a little bit strange, but we're going to focus on that interval right there. So we're going to go to that small interval C1 to C. You, you can absolutely apply the intermediate value theorem from negative 1 to 1, and we'll, we'll do that at the end, but that's not going to contradict, that's not going to provide contradictory information. So we don't know, so if I graph F, the only thing I really know, or that, well, I also know we're 1 up here, but let's just assume that we were lazy and didn't actually figure that out. So I know there's two points like this. Uh, there is, and, and we said there is a C1 and a C that are also 0. So I don't necessarily want to put C1 and C on one of the other sides of 0, so we'll just say they're right here. C1 and C. So our y coordinates are both 0. So what is the average rate of change from C1 to C? Zero. The function might go up, might go down in between, but either way it's going to it's either going to look something like that or something like that or something even more complicated, more like that. So in between has to go some way. Of all the three that I drew, no matter which of those, there's going to be one or more points with a zero slope. What goes up must come down. In this case, what goes down must come back up because we have two x-intercepts. So either way, whichever of the ones you want to draw or think about, your function has to have some bend to it if it's going to come back to the x-axis. And there has to be some point where the slope is 0, matching the average rate of change, which the mean value theorem is the precise way to say that. So that's all the intuition right there. There has to be some point in between those that has a zero slope. Now, why am I allowed to say that? Because of the mean value theorem, not because, hey, look at the picture, it makes sense. So let's write out the mean value theorem. So we have f is diffable on C1 to C because it is a polynomial. I will take off a point if you don't tell me why your function is continuous or differentiable. Or rational function. Um, I probably won't go with square roots. Your trig functions are all continuous on their, and differentiable on their. Um, domains. So as long as, you know, my interval doesn't span a vertical asymptote for tangent or cotangent, they would all be differentiable as well. So if it's a trig function, you could say trig functions, uh, this trig function is differentiable whenever we don't have vertical asymptote. And sine and cosine don't have vertical asymptotes. So. You can say the same thing for polynomials too, right? Like yeah, well, rational functions, yeah. So as long as you're not divided by zero and that x value is not in your interval you're using, you're okay. All right, so we got differentiable because it's a polynomial. That's all we really need for the MVT. Hey, I have a question for you. Yeah. With vertical asymptotes, is there a way of, is, is there like a, almost like a mean value theorem for saying that there is no vertical asymptote between two vertical asymptotes, if you were to say, or between, is there a, well, the, any of these theorems, whether it's mean value theorem or intermediate value theorem, all have the uh, requirement that your function needs to be con at least continuous, right. including the endpoints and everything in between. No, I'm just saying, like, if you had, if you had a denominator and there was a, a polynomial inside the, uh, is there a way to prove that there is no vertical asymptote between two points? Uh, or do you just have to find all the vertical asymptotes and then? So we showed rational functions are continuous on their domains. Right. 
So between two vertical asymptotes will be an open interval. And we know ra the rational function is continuous on the open interval. Okay. So we can't have a vertical asymptote on that open interval okay. or between the two vertical asymptotes that you're thinking of. So that's how you would want us to say for a rational function. It's just like it's, it's continuous on its domain and dippable on its domain. We don't have to say as long as it doesn't divide by zero or because the domain won't divide by zero. So let's say your rational function has two vertical asymptotes <coughs> right here. What you can't do is use the intermediate value theorem on that <coughs> interval. Yeah. Or any, you can't use any of the value theorems if you're going to cross a vertical asymptote. Right. So it's not, it's not, yeah, it's not continuous, not differentiable. I can choose basically any closed interval in between the two, or I could choose a closed interval outside or outside on the other side. And you can't do an open interval, correct? N yeah, none of the value theorems use open intervals. Mm, I can't use one and I can't use three. Okay. So there, no matter what, you have to have actual space between the end of your interval and your vertical asymptote. Okay. So this, like this little tiny bit of space right here, that better not equal zero. So would you want us to um, find the vertical asymptotes to prove that the domain's not going to touch one? Like if you were to ask a rational question, would you want us to do that? Or is that not necessary? Uh, it's probably a good idea to do it. Um, so if you found the vertical asymptotes, you could say none of these are in the interval. Right. Yeah. Okay. And I wouldn't give you a killer function to uh, yeah. factor. Yeah, I'd give you an easy one to factor. All right. Did that help out? Yeah. A little bit. So you have to have, for any of the value theorems, you have to have a nice interval that's continuous. And for the mean value theorem, it needs to be differentiable as well. So you better not cross vertical asymptotes or everything gets screwed up. And what would you write if it did cross a vertical asymptote? You better not use any of these value theorems. Right, you would just say this is not. It's not differentiable and not continuous. Therefore, I can't use the, any of the value theorems on this interval for this function. Yeah, well, you just can't draw any, any conclusions from it. That's all. Um, so here, well, here's a really fast example of, so let's say we have some that. So we get, hey, look, here's a negative and positive y value on our interval right here. Does that mean there's an x-intercept or a y equals 0 value in between the two? Nope, because we kind of cheated to get from negatives to positives. We went infinity around. We didn't go that way. So intermediate value theorem is out. You can't conclude that there's an x-intercept between these two values. Uh, the other thing, let's look at average rate of change. So that's easy to draw out. Is there any point between these two x values that has that slope? Yeah. In fact, the way I drew it, every point has a negative slope. Every point in between these two x values has a negative slope here, no matter which one I pick. So none of these points are even close to that positive slope that I drew because we have this crazy vertical asymptote right there. So vertical asymptotes screw up both of the value theorems. Now I could find a point over here that has that slope, but the mean value theorem doesn't help me get that one. So there's two, the reason both value theorems fail on vertical asymptotes right there. All right, so we're back to the mean value theorem. So there exists. Because we keep using the letter C over and over, I just put C1 for the next C that we're going to use, and then C2 for the next C that we're going to use. So mean value theorem, there exists another C in the open interval such that 
This is f prime c2 equals f c minus f c1 over c minus c1. So this is a mean value theorem, except I, instead of using b's and a's, our points are c and c1 right there. So that's average rate of change. But we said f c and f c1 are both 0. So we can plug in those two values. which is 0 over whatever c minus c1 is, which is 0. All right, so there's a point with a derivative equal to 0. That was the intuition we got from the graph. So again, going back to the graph, in between these two points, there's a couple ways you could go sort of up and back down, or you can go down and then back up. Either way, you're going to have a point with a horizontal slope. So that's the mean value theorem uh, giving us that result, not just pointing to the graph and saying, hey, there better be a point with a flat slope. So we haven't contradicted anything yet. We also haven't taken a derivative. So when in doubt, in Calc 1, take a derivative. So let's take a derivative of f. So uh, somewhere, way up here, so it's x cubed plus 3x plus 1. Let me rewrite f before I write f prime. x cubed plus 3x plus 1. And now we will find f prime. All right, so that's easy to take derivative. So the question is, when is f prime of x equal to 0? What type of solution do we have here? So we could factor 0 product property. 3 is not going to equal 0. All right, so at some point, you better realize there's a problem. What is that problem? Square root of negative. So your two solutions are imaginary. So they're not real. So we get no real solutions. So what that means is there's no real number that has a zero derivative. So what does that mean about C2? Doesn't exist. So relating back to that anecdote, it's like supposing that I had food poisoning, but you don't know if I did or didn't. But you're supposing. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So it's like supposing I had food poisoning and then I don't throw up for a week. Your supposition must have been wrong. All right, so no real solution. So there's a few ways you could say this. You could say C2 is not real. Uh, and up here, we assumed it was real. Or you could just say C2 can't exist. It's probably a better way uh, to do it. So we'll conclude. So no real solutions. Thus, C2 cannot exist. All right, but, whoa. All right. So C2 cannot exist. All right, so at this point, either the mean value theorem is wrong or our supposition is wrong. So theorems are not wrong in math. It's not science class. You can't argue about theorems. So the theorem either is or it isn't. There is no, uh, it might be disproved later. 
Uh, if it might be disproved later, they call it a conjecture. What's that? Oh, there's plenty of theorems, conjectures that are out there that are not proved, pr that are unproven. Uh, lots of ones on prime numbers, uh, just people's intuition, basically. Uh, but they haven't gotten around to proving it. So I mean, the I theorem uh, gives us correct results. So because the result we got was impossible, it means our situation before that was not possible. So we contradicted the somewhere. Ah, I underlined it. We contradicted our supposition right here. So our supposition must be wrong. All right, so there is no other x value that makes this 0. Because if there is, that leads to a contradiction. So there can't be. So we used 0 because uh, we thought that the You're talking about in the first part? Yeah. I, I could have concluded that there must be a x value that has a, um, I could pick any y between negative 3 and 5. Okay. Okay. Uh, the reason I chose 0 is because the original problem uh, had a 0 right there. Okay. If I had that at equal 2, I would have chosen 2 for my y value. And then I would have, the second part, I would have said there was another y value that also, another x value that had a y value of 2. And so at that point, I'd be worried about, you know, two points here. I'd have the same problem that I either have to go up, I'd have a zero slope somewhere in between them. So this is probably the most difficult problem to answer. So if that would have been equals 2, would you have done f of c equals 2 over f of c1? The y values would have been 2. Uh, the x values would be somewhere between negative 1 and 1. You don't really get any more information about that. So the only... Yeah, so whatever y value I was trying to get originally. So we go from the most confusing problem to what at least will start out as relatively easy. So it's a scary word, antiderivatives. Let's start with the definition. No, that's the day I made this. Oh, okay. I created this file. That's nothing to do with, yeah, you could ignore those dates. Okay. I don't know. There's probably some way to set it so the date is the date it was last updated. Uh, that would be a nice feature. All right, definition F is an anti derivative. So I'm going to be lazy and write anti d for anti derivative, anti derivative of f, little f, if the derivative of big F is little f. So one thing you notice, I use an, an, uh, an indefinite article and antiderivative because there's 
actually infinite antiderivatives, as we'll find out. And we are going to use uh, just intuition to find antiderivatives. So we're going to jump right into examples. Another function, okay. yeah. What do we just do f sub two? Yeah. Or uh, there's a notation for antiderivatives, which we'll definitely get into okay. uh, very soon, actually. Okay. I'll uh, but I'll just write the word antiderivative now. Okay. All right. Of so, we'll start out with two x. All right, think for 10 seconds about what function has a derivative of 2x. Think with your brain, not your mouth. All right, so x squared. I heard your thought out loud. All right, how do we check? Take derivative. So are we right? 2 times x to the first power is 2x. There we go. And that is little f. Question for you. Yeah. Although, like, plus whatever becomes 0, right? Yep. So how do you deal with that? We'll do it in a, in a few minutes. Okay. So what we're going to do is basically pick. It is true that x squared plus 1 has the same derivative. Uh, but the we're generally going to go with the easiest version that has that derivative, okay. which is just don't add a constant to it. All right, second one. Oops, I didn't leave space for it. F of x equals. So the best way, in my opinion, to do antiderivatives is guess and check. So guess what you think it will be. And check by taking a derivative. So guess by writing down your guess, and then take a derivative and see if your guess is right. So take a guess on your paper, and take a derivative to see if you're right. So I'm going to guess sine f prime derivative of sine is cosine x. So that one was pretty straightforward. So take a little bit of time and guess for, guess at the antiderivative of sine. And then check and see if you're right. So I'm going to guess cosine x. What is the derivative of cosine x? All right, so I was wrong. Negative cos x. So we'll try negative cos x, which will give us a negative negative sine x, or regular just sine x. So guessing and checking is a good strategy for antiderivatives, because to get it wrong, you have to have a bad guess. And hopefully, you've been practicing derivatives long enough that you can take a derivative correctly. So you have to have a bad guess, and then take your derivative incorrectly. So that's why I like to guess and check. You kind of have to be wrong twice to actually have the wrong answer. So next up, let's get crazy. 2x plus cos x. It's not really that crazy. All right, take a guess and take a derivative and make sure you're right.
So addition and subtraction is really good with derivatives and antiderivatives because you can just take the derivative separately. So it's literally the antiderivative of one plus antiderivative of the other. It's a bit more painful. Uh, a lot more painful. All right, let's do a brain teaser. Make you think. Oh, that's a good idea. That's a good stepping stone. All right, 4x to the 5 sevenths power. Take a guess. You'll probably get the coefficient wrong, but hopefully you'll get the power right. So don't worry about the coefficient. Just guess at what power you should use. And then take the derivative. I'll give you a hint. It's some amount of sevenths. <laughs> Anybody want to be brave and guess how many sevenths? 13. Almost 13. So what do you have to do to 5 sevenths to get the new power? Add 1. Add one. So we're going to add 7 sevenths to 5 sevenths and get 12 sevenths. So I'm going to do the opposite of derivative, which is instead of bring it down by 1, we're going to bring it up by 1. So that's 12 sevenths. I'm just going to guess, just put 4 in front. And then we'll take a derivative and see what we get. Wouldn't it be 4 divided by 12 7s? Yeah, it's not the right thing. We'll, we'll get the right thing in a minute. So f prime of x is 4 times 12 7 x to the 12 7 minus 7 7 is 5 7 So what's wrong? 4. No, 4 is okay. I, wa I want the 4 there. That stupid 12 7 So what we're going to do. Divide by 12 sevenths and divide by 12 sevenths right there. So I'm just. Oh, so just finish it up afterwards. Yep. Of of and you can remember, you can multiply by a constant and not change your derivative because of the constant multiple rule. So as long as you multiply, you know, f by that number, f prime is multiplied by that number. Uh, we can make this look a little less ugly. We'll multiply by the reciprocal. 7 twelfths times 4. Four, and that'll look a little nicer. Seven thirds. All right, so there's fractional power right there. It's a little bit tricky because you have to, instead of multiply by the new power, you actually divide by that new power. And again, guess and check is the universal that works to get almost any antiderivative until they get really complicated. All right, secant squared of 2x. So first of all, what function has a derivative of secant squared? Tangent. So let's just try tangent of x. What is, let me skip a line, what is f prime of x? So the tangent is secant squared x. So that's not going to work. It's close, it's getting there. What do I need to do to x? Not quite square it, but put 2x in its, in its place. So I'm going to go in and delete x. 
and I'm going to put 2x. Of course, that's going to change our derivative. So our derivative is secant squared of 2x times what? Times 2. So as our chain rule it says, times an extra 2. I don't want this 2 here. So we're very close to what we want. We're off by a multiple now. So if I don't want the 2, I'll divide by 2. But I have to be fair. I have to divide everybody by 2. I can only do this because of the constant multiple rule. Uh, if you don't like division, no problem. I don't like it either. Let's multiply by a half. How about that? So multiply instead of divide. So this one should rack your brain a little bit. We're going to learn what's called u substitution that lets you do things like this. Uh, it's a good question to figure out on your own. <laughs> well, wouldn't it be secant, be secant squared of x squared times oh, stuff? Right. It would be close. Um, all right, so that was antiderivatives. All right, now unfortunately we have to go right when it's getting good. All right, we'll be. Finish chapter four soon.